Welcome back to Element 14 Presents. I'm Clem and I have to challenge myself all the time. So this time we're building a laptop. <laughs> gotcha. I want to challenge myself really hard. So this time we're gonna build a laptop from scratch. I have teasered that in a previous episode, like when we built the keyboard or ran Linux on ESP32. So this time I'm really going beyond all the stuff I'm already comfortable with. So what is the actual difference between a laptop and a normal PC? It's not just that the screen is integrated and the keyboard, also the processor is usually more energy efficient. Haha, <laughs> got you. But the actual real difference is the power system. In a computer, all the peripherals are usually connected with all these cables that supply all the different voltages the system needs, and that comes from a power supply. But in a laptop, all that has to be done from batteries, and usually from single cell LiPos to make the unit as compact and flat as possible which is quite of a challenge. In the keyboard episode, we turned it into a true wireless keyboard by adding this little board that allows it to be powered by a single LiPo cell, but just one of these cells will not be enough to power a whole computer system. So we have to iterate on that design and find a solution to charge and discharge multiple cells while keeping them safe without blowing them up, which could be kind of challenging. So I've looked up uh, how usually laptops are powered and turns out they have really complicated powering schemes. It is not trivial to put multiple cells in series and parallel and then still charge them individual and protect them. That is a whole can of worms that I'm not ready for yet. I'm not an engineer, remember that, I'm just a maker. But I already know how to make a charging circuit for one cell that also protects it correctly. And I think I found a solution to put more of them in parallel so they can all be charged from one source, yet they are still all protected in the same way. But that also means that we can't just put them in series to get higher voltages. We have to step up the voltage, which complicates things even more. Welcome to KaiCat. It's time to look at the charging circuit that I came up with. But first, this is basically the interface connector. Uh, this comes from the keyboard. This goes data onward. And here is the power bus for the rest of the system. So I do it in chunks. I design one thing after another and hopefully figure out all the stuff as we go. Remember, this is hard, <laughs> especially for me, because I don't know what I'm doing. So here's USB-C. This is where the power comes in. And then we have four times the same circuit. I actually only use three because I could only fit uh, three on the board, three batteries basically on the board. And I hope this just is enough. So the charging circuit is the same that we used in countless other designs because I know how to build that. I've got the parts. I know how to troubleshoot it, stuff like that. Proven working design. And this protects the battery, it charges it, it knows when to stop charging, when to stop discharging, and that also means that each of these cells is individually managed, which also means that if something goes wrong with one cell, the unit is still functional, and the other cells could just take over the duties, and there's no like blowing up involved. <laughs> uh, but how do you parallel parallelize these? Well, you have to put them through diodes and these are shot key diodes which have a bit less uh, forward voltage drop there is still some of course there are much more efficient solutions but i'm not sure how to implement them correctly without making uh, everything go up in flames but with shot key diodes i know that these are basically isolated from each other on the discharge side and the charge side doesn't matter that can be on one place. The only thing that we really have to consider is we need to have enough current going in to uh, sufficiently power all these chargers because if the current is too low, then they won't start charging at all. Yeah, and here we have a little microcontroller. It's another ESP32S3 and this just reads some buttons and a little Nintendo Joy-Con which should act as a mouse and you hold it basically like a gamepad. I've saw that in an LGR video uh, there was an, an old Japanese-only IBM laptop that had controls like that, and I thought, 
that is a really clever solution for a small laptop. So I'm uh, trying to use that one. You also should see how that works in uh, practice. These holes are all basically legacy dependent because that is the holes of the uh, keyboard that we made before. Also here is a little window for uh, the LEDs of the keyboard to shine through and that left me only with this very inconvenient space for the Mac controller and I have to make all this long connection here for the USB port for charging and programming that Mac controller. It's not ideal. It's a first iteration and the main thing that I want to achieve is can I have safe multi-cell charging and protection. I've decided to use the CM4 form factor for my CPU module. As you've seen in the USB42 Linux version, I've made a module that fits that, and if I then finish it by building a GPU for it, I could make my whole system just run on ESP32s, which would be awesome. But for the time being, instead of that, I just plug in a Compute Module 4 and try to run it off of that. Big culprit with that is the Compute Module 4 needs a lot more power, and I think it's also a bit more finicky on stabilized power, plus a rather janky uh, first attempt at a step-up converter design might not be the ideal case. But before we plug anything of that in, we have to test our charging circuit. Simple way to test the charging circuit is basically plug in a battery with a known voltage, so measure that, and then apply power, and over time, like every few minutes or so, you write down the current voltage that it has, or you use a data logging solution. I like the cheap crude way with just a multimeter, and if it goes up, yay. Then we have to check, does it stop at the right voltage, usually 4.1 something or 4.2 volts. And if you discharge it, usually can, you can do that with an electronic load, which I don't have, but I just use a shunt resistor for that. You can also draw all the power out of it, and hopefully the unit shuts down when over discharge occurs. If that all behaves correctly, you know your charging circuit is working. But Clem, I hear you ask, isn't it really dangerous to run multiple chargers in parallel? Couldn't they influence each other and mess up the charging algorithms and stuff and things could blow up? Yes, yes, they could do. Yes. So, two things. First, you have to be sure that your input of charging voltage is sufficient to carry enough current. So I have three active chargers at the moment. These three each can draw 500 milliamps, so I have to have a charge of at least two amps because 1.5 amp is what they usually draw, plus a bit of overhead to make sure it doesn't go into saturation, aka it doesn't just stop its output because of too much current draw, which would just lock up the whole thing. Hopefully, if it's a quality charger. If not, then maybe things can go very wrong. And the other thing is the outputs have to be separated. That means they can't influence each other. They have to be protected with Zener diodes. Zener diodes have a, a, small, a smaller voltage drop than other uh, uh, normal diodes. There are a lot better, more efficient solutions to put all these cells in parallel, but uh, I couldn't figure out those. And I'm not sure if they would also protect against reverse stuff. So I know the diodes will work just from experimentation. I'm not sure about the other solutions, so I'm going with diodes. Safety first. Charger testing is concluded and it works. All the cells can be individual charged. They are all individually protected. They stop when they need to, they protect against over discharge, and it doesn't seem they influence each other. We have a bit of a voltage drop, not too much. We can still power the rest of the system with it. Speaking of rest of the system, let's put it all together. First we make it working, then we make it pretty, if we get to that. Hi, I'm David from Element 14 to the Electronics Inside. Join me as I tear down toys, tools, appliances, modern, vintage, classics, and even some new releases just to find out what's inside. Speaking of pretty, pretty complicated is it to design a step-up converter. I've never done that before. We have to make 
two designs to go from 3.7 aka 4.2 volt LiPo voltage up to 5 volt for our main CPU and also we go, have to go up to 12 volts for the screen or at least 9 volts because I know the screen also works on 9 volts if we can supply enough current. Anyway, hop on over to KiCad again. Welcome back to my computer and KiCad and this sheet looks empty almost, but it also has subsheets on there. So I'm using the form factor of the Compute Module 4 or the upcoming Compute Module 5 whenever that comes out. Uh, for my pseudo sound, which means it should be compatible with both and I can use the pinout or the symbols and stuff of the compute module already for this schematic. So this is the GPIO side. Then we have the high speed side and this over here is the FPC bus system or basically this is only it. <laughs> That's not even all. We have more. So a laptop is a big thing. Yeah, that, this is basically my magnum opus. I've never designed a step-up converter in my life before. I've always done LDOs, low dropout voltage regulators, or at least used pre-made step-down converters, but I've never designed a step-up converter from scratch. Was this a bad idea to do? Maybe. Is it something that I, is very challenging to me and maybe for you as well? Yes. Is it entertaining to watch me uh, try that? Maybe. Let's find out. I am... Um, very, very anxious because this is probably the most complicated thing I've designed on this channel yet. Wish me luck. So I can't use the device with a pseudo sum for now because that has not this thing, which is a GPU. So I have to use a Raspberry Pi compute module, which does have a GPU. Not like that, like an integrated one, a small one. But also this draws a lot more cur uh, current and is a bit more finicky, but let's just give it a go and see if my step-up converter design is any good. During the design phase, I was very unsure if my ratings were correct, if I choose the right uh, inductors and stuff, because I'm doing this for the first time. I have no clue about power supply design. I'm just learning. And I was pretty sure I'm in the right ballpark. And I expected that these behave a bit more like LDOs, like they would clamp the voltage to the fixed output voltage. Like I expected that if you buy a fixed voltage step up converter, I expected that to be fixed in voltage for the output. Turns out it's not. Nope, it's not. My output now uh, varies between seven volts and 4.5 or 4.2 actually. So, well, it does step up all the stuff, but it's putting out seven volts under, uh, without any load. So if I put load on that, will it drop to 5 volts? The uh, datasheet for the compute module says it will tolerate up to 6 volts, not 7. I don't know what happens there. Will I just fry it or will it do something else? And there's also the screen, which goes to 11 volts, the second step up converter. That worked quite good. I can also trim it with the potentiometers and that seems to supply enough power. But what happens if we put it all together? Let's try. So speaking of putting it all together, I've wasted about two kilos of high quality resin. Uh, <laughs> I've spent a long time uh, doing an alternative laser cut design. I'm getting constant trouble in fabricating that on the last few bits, just the last few things. So before I spend any more time on going mad about 3D printing and uh, building a case for that stuff, I would like to know first if it's even worth building the case. So we have to make sure that all the other stuff works first. So the, 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 the blinky lights go blinky and the screen does flickery things and uh, powering the screen externally yields to too much voltage on the Raspberry Pi, which makes it not work anymore. Sorry, I may have killed the Pi. By experimenting and in settings changing and stuff, I have concluded the Pi is not dead yet. It just got into like a stall mode or something. And if I have the screen powered, or basically I apply a load to the screen stuff and power the screen externally, then I get a different picture, which is just a white line, um, but I can't get any valid signal. And it seems the 
module tries to boot it. It's blinking, it does its cycle, but suddenly it just stops for some reason. And I think what it's doing is it's having a brownout for under voltage. The voltage drops to 4.5 volt at its best when it's under load and it draws about 4 amps completely. The Pi itself draws about 1.5 amps and during the first boot phase it goes up to 2.6 amps. So I think it's trying to boot but it's just browning out. So that's bad and that's the power supply design. So that's my shoddy design, which is a learning experience. So step up converters, hard. In a, just a Hail Mary, <laughs> I've tried the same thing with a compute module light in hopes that it may draw less power, uh, but it has exactly the same outcome. I thought I have killed two compute modules now by over voltage, but turns out if it goes over the six volts, then I think there's some safety thing in there where it just shuts down before it gets killed. So they seem to be working on a normal uh, standard compute module I.O. board, but they can't get enough power on my specialty quirky board. So, well, guess I'm not building a laptop from scratch on the first try, but I still learned a ton of things and there's a way forward. I did go far out of my comfort zone on this project. It could have been the magnum opus or the project that makes me. And it didn't break me yet. I basically I have the, the keyboard. I have a vague idea about how power supplies do. I have a charging circuit that works now. And I have a compute module that just needs a GPU that I have to build myself. So instead of trying to mangle the power supply in some stupid way, I have to make a full design revision and basically start from scratch. Turns out it's a really dumb idea to try to make one project fit everything. Like it should work with a compute module, it should also work with a pseudo sum, it should work with everything. I should have focused more on the exact thing and make the stuff in order. So make the pseudo sum complete first, then build a laptop around it. And also I've used an off-the-shelf screen that is absolutely glorious if you just stick a Raspberry Pi to it on the back, but it's not the most energy efficient solution if you want to build a laptop around it. So I also have to learn about DVI signals, LVDS stuff and basically making an integrated GPU that can drive a screen directly so I can omit a lot of circuitry that is very power hungry. Also, switch power supplies, wow, that is a complicated thing. Stick with LDOs as long as you can, but one day you will have to go into these switching regulators. I have a lot of learning left to do with those before I can tackle that again. And I now know how freaking hard laptop design is. Even just the power segments. Wow, this is how the whole thing would go together. On the bottom we have the uh, keyboard with the charging circuitry. On the top we have our actual computer with all the power circuitry that we did and that would fit behind the screen and it opens like this. So the flat flex cable are in the hinge and we can, because it's modular, we can just replace each of these parts. And turns out this modular approach is dumb because I can't like change anything that's on the other board if I discover an error later or it's dependent on some factor on there, which did limit me quite a lot to get this done in time. I've just worked like for a month on this. So building a laptop on the first try, uh, I'm not sure if that's even possible, but at least I tried and I give it a second shot because there is a great way forward in making it work, not for all the modules, but just one specific one, the pseudo sum. I want to make it truly from scratch so I don't even have to rely on a Raspberry Pi anymore. So Element 14 community, I need you. We are going to build a GPU, not like this, but smaller, <laughs> for this little module. Integrated into that thing and I need to learn proper step-up converter design. I hope I find a screen that I can use with DVI signals or LVDS if I ever figure out how that works uh, directly. That is not as power hungry as that big screen that I tried to use in this project. 
but I really need your expertise. Please let me know what I'm doing wrong. I want to learn from you, the community, and together we maybe be able to build a completely open source laptop. And it would be really awesome it would be, if it would be exclusively powered by ESP32s and the occasional RP2040. But I don't even want it to rely on a, a compute module anymore. So like, no pre-made computers in that. <laughs> that would be awesome. Also, we need help on the software side because the USB uh, host functionality is not done yet for the ESP32 Linux. So if you have expertise on that, please help, please. I would have loved to show you the completed laptop now, but the reality is different. I did go far beyond my comfort zone and I'm not an engineer and this is real engineering territory. So step up converter design, no joke. If you know your ways around that topic, let me know. I would really appreciate your input and your help to conclude this project someday. So <laughs> we are going to build more parts for this and maybe one day I will be able to make a complete laptop from scratch with your help. Let me know down below in the comments and on the Element 14 community and I gotta go, there's another project waiting for me.